Thank you so much, Simon, and welcome everyone to this session. This is an initiative spotlight on the International Platform for Climate Finance, and it's fantastic to have Steve Waygood with us. Steve, tell us what motivated Aviva to take on this challenge, quite a big challenge for a company to take on. Sarah, thank you very much for the invitation to be here, and also thank you to Jeffy as well. Brilliant initiative, fantastic panel, a huge group of people here. Um, just wonderful to be able to have the conversation with you all about what we're trying to achieve. But first of all, why are we trying to work in this space? As you say, what motivated us to think about the climate crisis and try to effectively re-engineer international financial markets? I'll come to how in a minute, but why? Firstly, there's the case for our, our shareholders, a fiduciary case, if you like. Uh, we're very clear as a sector, the insurance sector has huge trouble with its business model north of three degrees and north of four degrees is arguably an existential crisis um in fact others would argue that north of three um, is existential now as a listed business with a duty to shareholders and one that's been around for 325 years we do think over a long time frames so that fiduciary duty to our shareholders to do what we can to try and correct this market failure is part of what motivates us another more important part is we have 33 million clients, individuals who've got pensions, insurance, savings, et cetera, with us. And they all have clearly an interest in retiring, if you like, in a planet which is pleasant to live in. And at three degrees, that's not going to be the case. And our science and our actuarial science shows us that the implied temperature change of the London Stock Exchange is way closer to three and a half degrees than one and a half. Um, that's pretty, not only is it a challenging environment to live in, it's a challenging environment for civilization to exist within, certainly in the way that we understand it today. So, I mean, I'm saying it's for our shareholders, it's for our clients, but it's for everyone, really. And that brings me to, to the third argument. This is all about ethical finance, isn't it? This conference. And people who work in finance are human beings. We have ethics, we have values. And as individuals, we're all concerned. We're all deeply concerned. And we also have agency. Working for very large financial institutions, it's possible to engage with the politicians and policymakers and encourage them, support them and challenge them. And I would argue in this section where we're talking about macroeconomic issues, macro stewardship, where large financial institutions engage with governments to reshape the system, to correct the market failure, that has never been more important. And I'd also argue we've got a duty to do that through our duty to maintain market integrity. But I'm going off on a legal tangent. But those are the, those are the main motivators, Sarah. So, t so tell us then a little bit about what this thing is, the International Platform for Climate Finance. Sorry, International Platform yeah. for Climate Finance. Thank you, Sarah. So it's, it's two things. It's, it's an idea or a set of ideas, and it's also a coalition. Um, the easy bit is the coalition. There's around about 250 people now who have um, indicated an interest in participating in a phone call. That's really what it is. And every month we spend a couple of hours sharing ideas, making observations about the changing conversation around climate finance, We've been meeting in different ways since November 2019. And all of us, it's not just financial institutions, it's multi-stakeholder. You've got NGOs there, you've got business schools, um, there's other big thinkers. Um, and we come together to share our ideas and to all discuss how do you harness markets so that they help deliver a smooth and just transition on or before 2050. That's effectively uh, what Paris implies. That's the biggest question of all. So that coalition, some of us are public, um, for example, the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, it's great having Jeffy as part of the group. We've also got WWF there. It's various financial institutions that join, some of which have convened this conversation today. Um, and that call produces white papers. And those white papers then we take to the various policy people who are involved in COP26 and the G20 and G7 conversations around climate finance. So we've enjoyed amazing access, actually. It's been an incredible experience to people like Mark Carney and Nigel Topping, and we've spoken to Alex Sharma in his office and 
various others globally at the in, in Italy, at the Bank of Italy, and also increasingly in the White House, in the US administration there, to try to advocate for the ideas. Which brings me to the actual second bit, the ideas themselves. So if you if you sort of step back for a second, every financial institution is now encouraged to produce a net zero target and a, and a plan to deliver it. Aviva produced one recently. We've committed to be net zero on or before 2040. That's our ambition. We will disclose progress against that. So if, if we as financial institutions are expected to do that, if companies are encouraged to do that, and countries are too, who's coordinating all of this? We need part of the international financial architecture to be responsible for making sure this well-managed transition is actually well-managed and that it's somehow orchestrated or at least measured. And there is a clause within the Paris Agreement that um, clause 21C for the sake of argument, but it, 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 it implies that governments should be doing this already and they're not yet. So that's partly one of the concepts. We need a, a vision and a strategy for how you harness markets to deliver that transition. And then a more practical part of the vision is part of the international financial architecture includes the OECD. It was originally built to help restructure Europe after the Second World War and to mobilize the roughly 20 billion of assets uh, in, in those prices, near 140 today, uh, which was spent on restructuring, rebuilding Europe after the Second World War. The OECD was a European initiative. It's gone global in the last 50 years, or at least more global. But I think it's challenged for this century, given that it has some very good economists there, some very good scientists who understand the environment. I think its new challenge needs to be harnessing global markets and helping coordinate all of the international financial architecture, central banks, finance ministries, the multilateral development banks, the World Bank specifically, the IMF and so on and so on, as well as all the financial regulators for pensions, insurance and investment, um, and also the national forums for these uh, conversations to take place. We need a coherent and choreographed conversation. And the OECD, I think, could facilitate that. And it could particularly help developing countries access private finance within developed countries. The OECD is considered a rich country club, even though it still has Chile, Colombia, or increasingly is reaching out to middle income and lower income countries, but nevertheless, still predominantly rich, rich country club. So we, we can make use of that. If you're a developing country and you need to understand how to access finance, you need a technical assistance program. Somebody somewhere needs to be able to teach you how to mobilize money to finance your nationally determined contribution. Uh, and Sarah, you will understand the power of education and its purpose. Um, my, my experience in the last 20 years of working in finance is I haven't found anyone anywhere in the world who understands the whole of it. It's yeah. just too big. <laughs> so that's part of the point of the coalition. And so I've given you a sense of how we work and then what we're trying to achieve. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. I think there's that interesting issue of understands it versus also the different partners coming together to make sure that any solutions are implementable. Um, and that's the difficulty of what happens if one one group or one party uh, tries to put something forward. You mentioned Mark Carney. I, I heard him recently talk about people becoming policy, policy shapers, not policy takers. Um, and that sense that we need the right people to be shaping what the policy looks like, not just taking the policy. Um, so, so how does, I mean, IPCF, it sounds great, but there are all uh, other initiatives happening as well. So how does it relate to other initiatives that are aiming at sort of private finance for sustainable development? How does it fit into that kind of architecture? Thank you. Uh, really important question, sir. So firstly, it doesn't replace anything. It doesn't compete with anyone. It's trying to provide a coherent framework for everyone to operate within in a way that they can be more effective and more efficient because they're more coordinated and we're not doubling up. So there's there's that kind of, uh, there's, there's a huge number of initiatives now and that, that can cause trouble when one's trying to understand how they all fit together, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't criticize people for taking initiative. We need everyone everywhere to take initiative. It's a massive system change challenge 
and all systems need to change. So this is, Rachel Coates said that recently, and I think she's absolutely right. So it doesn't compete, it coordinates, it helps, it's there to facilitate and it's there to scale because it's obvious that nothing yet is at sufficient scale. We're talking about a trillion a year and that is an enormous sum. It's four times the whole Apollo program plus the whole Marshall program each year for the next 15 years. So of course it's gonna need some level of coordination and it's not just enough for the US to try and put its hand in its pocket or Europe, uh, the European Commission with Ursula van der Leyen and her Green Deal. We need to harness private finance. So it doesn't compete, it does collaborate, it tries to help uh, achieve synergies. It, it, it doesn't replace the need to internalize externality. So it's the whole conversation that's absolutely fundamental about pricing carbon. It's not really about pricing carbon, although of course people could come up with better ways of doing that. And I'm sure people on the IPCF have ideas. It also doesn't replace net zero. It seeks to amplify it and help financial institutions deliver it, particularly as every net zero initiative is clear that we need governments to make the real economy net zero. So how do you help them do that? As Mark Carney was saying, how do we shape the policy? And that brings me to the TCFD. I've been on that since its outset in 2015. Um, been very proud to help shape the policy, but it's only a, a measure of emissions and how companies are responding to transition risk and physical risk. It's a better thermometer. It's not turning the heat down in the system. So we need to turn the heat down. And the TCFD is a hugely important part of this, but even that doesn't require transition plans, doesn't require companies to be net zero. So obviously I've been making those observations in the TCFD plenaries. I think there's a bit of development that we need to do there too, but the IPCF helps bring this all together, helps provide a space where, where fund managers and systemically important financial institutions can meet central bank governors and finance ministers, each holding the other to account, each shaping what the other can understand about the other, so that we can collectively deliver a smooth and well-managed transition to net zero on or before 2050. It is absolutely critical that we do for human rights, for the environment, for life on earth, for civilization, and for people's pension savings and investment. So that gives you a, a sense of what we're trying to do and how it fits in with the other parts of the ecosystem. I wonder if what we're saying here is that we're taking the, the measurement, the monitoring, et cetera, and, and then accelerating action, accelerating the mm. implementable solutions and not action at the scale of one company because that is uh, relatively pointless unless it can lead to action across the whole system. And that's what you're, you're trying to achieve here. Absolutely, precisely. Very well put. Okay, thank you. Um, so what progress have you made so far? What's next for the IPCF? And importantly, how can people get involved? But also what should people expect if they do get involved? So we've made some very good progress. We've produced a few white papers. Um, if people want to have a look at one, uh, simply Google or use a search engine of your choice. Uh, Aviva and International Financial Architecture. And there's a, a paper, a white paper that sets out how we would recommend the G20 harnessing the international financial architecture. I referred to the OECD already and how it could be repurposed for the for this new century. But there are also ideas for the IMF and the World Bank and the IFC and so on. So um, there's a, a white paper. I'm very pleased that um, it's got a lot of traction. Um, I'm also aware that it's been well read within the institutions that we're seeking to address. Um, not only have they pretended to, but we've had good conversations with people within the institutions that we're, we're encouraging. Um, next, I think we need to, for example, with the OECD, we need to address the member states of the OECD and, and ensure one or more of the countries wants to take this forwards, because otherwise it won't happen. We also need to make sure the outgoing and incoming Secretary General of the OECD um, understands what it is that we're proposing and, see, and, and, and sees why it is the OECD that's the natural home for this. Um, so we, we've got some advocacy in, in short to continue with. And particular focus in the short term is obviously the G7 that the UK is hosting. There's the G20 in Rome in October, but before that we have the finance track in Venice in July. And uh, we intend to be there and the white paper we are doing what we can with all the Sherpas in advance to try to advocate for the ideas. Um, 
we're not, by the way, pretending they're the final word. There are plenty of other ideas that that, that, that need to be brought forwards to harness this trillion. Um, and so we've got then big moments. There's also the UN General Assembly in September, and this is all before COP, yeah. which is still still scheduled at, at this moment to be in November. Um, there's a chance it might be postponed again, um, which would be a shame in one sense, but also an opportunity in another uh, to make the ideas even bigger and get great traction. So those that's the kind of next steps and some of our progress thus far. I'm very, very pleased in terms of progress to have had such phenomenal access to the COP26 team and the high level champions and not just in the UK either, but uh, around the world. Um, we also need to reach out to developing countries and we're, we're working through the UN to do that, to convince them that this is for them and in their interests and actually capital is most at need there. It's also most expensive. It also contributes the biggest bang for the buck from a climate perspective. If you put a solar array in an equatorial country, then of course it's going to deliver more than in Scotland. Sorry, Sarah. Um, but we have a um, we have an opportunity, and I think markets are failing to deliver for developing countries, and that that we need to, to change that. And so, how people can get involved? Very simply, let me know that they're interested. It's a multi-stakeholder phone call. My ideal is that people are public. Their institutions join the coalition. They advocate for change publicly, but private attendance is very welcome, even if people just want to listen and learn, but ideally they share their ideas um, and it costs nothing. Um, it's really important, I think, that we have this grassroots movement, if you like, for change, uh, coming as a multi-stakeholder approach, working with the policymakers, trying to learn from each other to shape the future we need to see, because for net zero, all accounting needs to change, all insurance, all investment, every sector. We're developing new measures, new processes, new governance structures, and we're trying to manage this all in real time. Um, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. But we have to do this. We absolutely have to. There's an imperative for, from a shareholder perspective as well as for clients. So I, I hope that answers your question, Sarah. It sure does. I wonder if my my sneak a final question in, um, which is, I think sometimes it can seem a bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, for, for, you know, your last message there was about everything that needs to change. And there may be people at this conference, at this Jeffy conference, listening to that and thinking, how do we possibly make that happen as quickly as we need to? Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of uh, words of wisdom for people who are thinking like, about that? Well, I, I've worked in the area for 25 years. I've seen huge change in just the last two, even the last five months, the, the speed the pace of change, the scale of change is absolutely fantastic. This is what we've dreamed of really for 20 years. We have finance ministers around the world, not just one or two, but finance ministers around the world, all coordinating through a climate uh, change initiative of finance ministers. We also have the network for greening the financial system, nearly 100 central bank governors, deputy governors. That's fantastic. You know? <laughs> not many people get super excited about this kind of thing. I do, it gives me hope. Um, and we also have a conversation now with the, of course, the US is a game changer. Biden hasn't just changed US politics. All of international finance has shifted because the US either controls overtly or covertly all of the international financial institutions that bring pensions, banking, insurance uh, and other investment together. Um, so all the institutions, all of the multilateral bodies can now do what they have been wanting to for a long time. Biden is a game changer. So that is what gives me hope. Um, it's my experience of, of the pace of change. And there's over 400 trillion in the global capital markets. So whilst a trillion is a lot of money, it's a really huge amount of money. There's way more than enough in the system. So we know the science, the politics is aligning. We're beginning to get a clear sense of the economics and how you harness the international financial architecture. Let's all get on with it. So I think we'll have to stop there, but if I may uh, make an observation, Biden has been a game changer undoubtedly, but in the international climate finance space, Steve, you've been a game changer as well, um, and an advocate for so long, uh, and in the early days in the face of such opposition. So uh, to have people to hold, hold true to that uh, has been a real uh, inspiration for many of us. So thank you so much for your contributions, and I hope everyone in the conference is enjoying the conference, and I hope that the International Platform for Climate Finance is something you might consider being involved in.